Thank you so much, Pastor Rob, for that introduction, for the invitation to be here. It is an incredible privilege uh, to be at River Valley Church because you are one of the greatest churches in the United States. And I'm not saying that because of the size of your congregation, it's because of the size of your heart. And what people know about your community is your generosity and your care for others. And I just wanna tell you what a great privilege it is to be here. I wanna thank Pastor for his invitation, uh, the entire staff for your hospitality. If you've watched these series on big words, uh, you've seen me making little introductions at the beginning of each. Uh, this month, or today, we're actually concluding the series. So far, we've covered immutability, the idea that God doesn't change, propitiation, the word that says that God has been appeased, his wrath against sin. We looked, yes, last week at justification, that God freely justifies us, that we can stand before God as innocent. Today, we're gonna look at the word sanctification, and I'm calling this the last big word. And when I say the last big word, I just don't mean that it's the last word for the sermon or for this series. It's actually a word that comes up in Scripture when people are saying goodbye. We actually find this word in the prayer of Jesus. In John chapter 17, Jesus is going to the cross in a few hours. He's about to be arrested. He's praying for his disciples and he talks about sanctification. Now here's the context, right? He is going to the cross, and he knows that how they are about to treat him is how they're going to treat his followers. If they're doing this to me, they're gonna do this to you. So his prayer to his father is that God would protect his disciples. And here's how Jesus prays it. John 17, beginning at verse 13. He's talking to God and he says, I'm coming to you now, but I say these things while I'm still in the world, so they, his disciples, may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you would take them out of the world, but that you would protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I've sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. Jesus prays in the knowledge that his disciples are gonna be hated by the same world that's about to crucify him. But here's his prayer. In praying for their protection, he's not asking that they would be kept out of the world. You know, I'll say this, sometimes as Christians, the world comes against us, and what I would really like to do is I would just like to hide. There are times I see what's going on in the world, and I'm like, I'm gonna go to bed, and I'm gonna stay there until all this is over. But that's not the prayer of Jesus. I'm asking you to protect them, Father, not by taking them out of the world. Why? Because I'm getting ready to send them to the world. Our protection is not to avoid the world. Our protection is so we can be in it. His prayer is that we'd be protected from the evil one, that we'd be protected, and I'm gonna say it this way, that as the world comes against us, we don't come against the world in the same way. When we act like the world, it means we're no longer acting like the church. And his prayer is that I'm sending them into the world and I want you to sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. What sets us apart is the revelation of God in Jesus. We as a church have a message that changes everything. And it's that message that sets us apart. It's that message that sends us into the world. And Jesus himself says what? I am being sanctified. I've been set apart. And now I'm praying for them for the same. Paul, when he's about to be arrested, Ephesians or Acts chapter 20, he meets with the elders from the church at Ephesus. He knows that in a few days, he's going to be arrested. So Jesus speaks to his disciples a few hours before his arrest. Paul speaks to the Ephesian elders a few days before his arrest, and he knows that it's the last time he's gonna see them on this earth. 
So what does Paul say to them? Here's what he says. Chapter 20, verse 31 of Acts. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years, I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. Now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Paul's message to the Ephesian church is that he knows when I go away, you're going to be attacked. There are people who are gonna try and come and they're gonna try and destroy the church. And my prayer for you is I'm committing you to God and to what? And to the word of his grace. The word of God is what sets us apart. And Paul says, I want you to make it to the end to join all of those who are sanctified. Now here's the thing that's shared between both Jesus and Paul, both of them, hours or days from their arrest, knowing that they are saying goodbye, pray for the protection of the church, and they pray for the ongoing revelation of God to keep the church set apart. Why do they bring up sanctification? Because sanctification is the word for making it to the end. Sanctification is the word for making it to the end. I'm praying you would be sanctified. I want you to join with those who are sanctified because I want you to make it all the way to the end. Sanctification becomes our last big word. So what does this word really mean? Well, the word actually comes from the word for holiness. And holiness is one of these really difficult words to translate or describe because holiness, the word holy, is the word we use to define all the other words. Holy is what we say when we're trying to describe God and we don't know how else to talk about God except his godness. He's holy. Well, what does that mean? It means he's God. What does that mean? It means he's holy. Okay, help me out here. What does that mean? Well, here's one thing it means. God is the only one in existence who is uncreated. Everything else that exists has been created. There was a time it did not exist. There was a time it will not exist. We don't control our existence. God alone is uncreated. And whenever in the Bible, God who is uncreated makes an appearance within creation, everything starts to feel a little weird and different and strange because you've never been in the presence of what's uncreated before. And creation, in a sense, recoils back in the presence of the uncreated. And all creation can say when they try to define God, when they try to define this experience of God, this presence of God, is to define God as something that's just not like us. He is other, he is other, he is other, he is holy, he is holy, he is holy. And when we come into the presence of God, we experience holiness and you say, well, what does that mean? And you're like, it just means different than us different than us in a way that if I'm not careful can be dangerous to me because it's so different. Israel, in wanting a relationship with God, had to deal with the holiness of God. And God, in wanting a relationship with his people, had to create a way for them to live in his presence with his holiness. And here's the incredible thing. God doesn't just make us holy because holiness belongs only to God. God brings us into his holiness so that in being in his presence, we can be called holy as well. I like to sometimes think of the holiness of God as if it's kind of like a house, but it's God's house. You know, my son, I have a son, he's 10. He lives in my house. He sometimes thinks it's his house, but he doesn't pay the bills. And I want to say to him, buddy, this is not your house. This is mom and dad's house. Really my wife's house because she takes care of it more than I do. But this is really mom and dad's house. You live in it. This is here for you, but you're not paying any of the bills. Yeah. 
If we ever lose the house, it won't be him that goes to court, it'll be me. Holiness is God's. We simply get the chance to live in it, to experience it, to share or reflect what's coming from God. And when we try to describe sanctification, which really just comes from the word for holiness, sanctification can be defined as the process by which we become holy for the sake of God. We become holy for the sake of God. God makes us holy, which means that God is bringing us over to his side. We live in a world where there's a lot of unholiness. When God comes on the scene, it can even be dangerous. What God is trying to do is bring us into his side so we belong to the things that are holy because they're fit for the presence of God, which is why we can be called saints. Because saint, like sanctification, all comes from the word for holy. I want you to look at your neighbor right now and say, you're a saint. Now look at your neighbor and say, I'm a saint. Now tell me, how many of you felt more awkward saying I'm a saint than you did saying you're a saint, right? I mean, sometimes we use this sainthood language in a way that we only want to apply it to the most special of people. So you might have the guy who declares, my mother was a saint, right? Maybe not your mother, but my mother was. And it's a special word. There's a whole branch of Christianity that will only use the word saint for people that they're sure are already in heaven. But when Paul describes the church, one of the most common ways he describes it is by using the language of saints. And here's what's amazing. Even when the church screws up, Paul still calls them saints. Read 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians is a letter written to a church that has really screwed up. And repeatedly, Paul calls them the saints. They're not the saints because they're perfect. They're the saints because they're already being made holy. Sainthood isn't about your moral perfection. It's that you already are in a process by which God is making you fit for his presence. I'm not a saint because I've arrived. I'm a saint because I'm already on the journey. I'm already on the journey. And sanctification is understood as that process. God is making us holy. Why? Because he wants us to be fit for him. He wants us to be set apart for his presence. Sanctification also means here being set apart. Again, if holy means God is other, then those who belong to that otherness of God have been set apart from everything else. And sometimes I like to describe it this way. How many of you have ever shared a refrigerator with someone that wasn't a family member? Maybe you had roommates like in college or maybe you have an office fridge. And how many of you have ever put food in that refrigerator that you didn't want anyone else to eat? So what do you do to that food? You label it. You write your name on it. I saw someone once post a meme that said, people have been writing names on their food and I don't understand it. Yesterday, I had a tuna fish named Kevin. You know, like they write your name. You write your name on your food. When you do that, what you've actually done is you have sanctified your food because you have set it apart. By putting your name on it, you've said, this food is for my use, it's not for your use. And when God sanctifies us, it's the same kind of thing. It's as if God takes us, he writes his name on us, and he says, this is for my use. It's not for your use, it's not for the world's use, it's not for Satan's use. You are being set apart by God for his use. Why? Because God is bringing his holiness to the world, and he wants to use you in that. We're set apart for God's service, we also are set apart for God's presence. We're not just set apart to be used by God, we're set apart to belong to God. Here's the thing, God sanctifies us because God wants a relationship with us. He wants us to belong in his presence. He wants to bring us in. He wants us to be a part of who he is. And in fact, not just us, 
but the entire world. So if you think of being set apart, and the first thing that comes to your mind is exclusivity, right? Here's another word here. If he's setting us apart, he's making a people that are exclusive. But the reason God does that is for the sake of inclusion. There's an exclusivity for the sake of inclusivity. And here's what I mean by that. I want us to look at what God sets apart in the Bible. What does he sanctify? And the first thing that we find is that God sanctifies worship for the sake of his people. The first time we start hearing this language of sanctification, it's related to the worship of God. What's the first thing he sanctifies? He sanctifies the Sabbath. All the way at the beginning of Genesis. And as he gives Israel the call for worship, he begins to sanctify all the elements of their worship. He sets it apart. So he sanctifies the tabernacle. This can only be used for the worship of God. He sanctifies the utensils in a tabernacle. If you have a bowl that's used for the worship of God, you can't take that home and put frosted flakes in it, right? It now belongs exclusively for this. He sanctifies places. He sanctifies people. He says to the priest and the Levites, you belong exclusively for the worship of Israel. What God sanctifies in the Bible begins with worship. And he sanctifies it by blood. He consecrates everything by the sprinkling of blood, by the very stuff of life, to show how important it is that this belongs to me. I'm the source of life. And this is going to be consecrated by the stuff of life. Not only that, but he tells Israel, if you're going to live in my presence, there's certain rules I want you to follow, and they're not always moral rules. Sometimes it's just like this. Because God's holiness is so other, there's certain things we have to do to be safe around God's otherness. Just like if you lived in a nuclear power plant, how do you know if you work there, there's going to be certain rules you have to follow? Right, like you can't lick the rods, right? There's certain things you have to do if you're gonna be there because of how dangerous potentially, even though it can be powerful, even though it can be helpful, there's still certain things we have to do. That's what all the cleanliness laws are about in the Bible. They're simply about knowing how to live with God's presence in the midst of you. But Israel's also called to reflect God morally because he sets us apart for his presence but he also sets us apart for his character. He wants us to reflect his character to the world. He brings us into his worship so that you can be in my presence. Why? So you can represent my presence when you go back out. You come in for worship so you can go back out for witness. All of that is sanctification. He sanctifies worship for the sake of his people, and he sanctifies his people for the sake of the world. God doesn't call Israel because he loves Israel more or only. He calls them for the sake of all people. He wants them to be a showcase nation to show all the other nations how God is. And even when Israel rejects that calling in the Old Testament, even when they sin, God still restores them because he wants Israel to see and the rest of the world how forgiving he is. God actually says it this way to Israel and the prophets. He said, I'm gonna bring you back to the land, not for your sake, but for my sake. So people will know what my name means. He sanctifies worship for the sake of his people so they can approach him. He sanctifies his people for the sake of the world. And finally, he sanctifies the world for the sake of his presence. Here's God's end game. He doesn't want to just have an exclusive people who are set apart. He wants them to be exclusive so eventually everybody can be included. Some scholars have argued that when you read the synoptic gospels, that's our words for Matthew, Mark, and Luke, one thing that you really find is it's like a travelogue. The Gospels begin with Jesus in Galilee, and then Jesus slowly moves down to Jerusalem. And the argument has been the reason it's structured this way is the name Jesus in, in Aramaic here is really the name Joshua. And who is Joshua in the Bible? He's the one who took the promised land for God. And that what you find in the story of Jesus is Jesus is moving through Israel, 
taking the land back for God. You're like, how is he doing that? Because he is the embodiment of the presence of God, which means everywhere he goes, they're experiencing the presence of God. Remember cleanliness laws? It's all about God's presence. In the ancient world in Israel, if you are unclean and you touch something, you make it unclean. But what happens in the ministry of Jesus? When he touches something unclean, it becomes clean because he's taking it back for the presence of God. Jesus throughout his ministry to Israel is sanctifying again and again and again. He sanctifies the sick. He sanctifies the lepers. He sanctifies the sinners. And at the very end, what's the last thing that Jesus sanctifies in the Gospels? It's the tomb. Because the tomb makes you unclean. But when Jesus rises from the dead, they can enter the tomb without being unclean because Jesus even makes death fit for the presence of God. Jesus sanctifies the land. And when we get to the end of the New Testament, we have this incredible vision of God's presence filling the world. Revelation 21, you have this image of a new Jerusalem. And you expect the new Jerusalem to look like the old Jerusalem, just bigger. But at the very heart of the old Jerusalem is a temple. Because the temple is where you can find the presence of God. And the author says, but I didn't see a temple there because God's presence was everywhere, because the Father and the Son filled the city. They didn't only need a temple, they didn't even need the Son, because the light from God's glory was enough. The whole end game of God is he wants to fill the world with his presence. You're like, well, God is everywhere. Yeah, but the world can't handle the godness of God. What he wants is a world that can live in the godness of God, that can live in the holiness of God, a world that will be sanctified. And we as believers are living towards this reality of a world that is being made ready for the presence of God. There are some people who are fighting this tooth and nail because they don't want to live in God's presence. They don't want to be made holy for God. And when they hear the presence of God, all they see is judgment. Revelation again tells us there comes a time when God makes himself known, people will cry for the mountains to fall on them just so they can escape the presence of God. But for those of us who are being sanctified, God's presence means salvation. It is a world without evil, a world without suffering, a world without death, and we who are being sanctified are the saints of God right now because we carry God's presence with us as a community into the world. So what does it mean for us to live out our sanctification? Well, number one, we practice our sanctification by worship. We practice our sanctification by worship. The first thing God does when he sets Israel apart is he sets apart the worship of Israel. He does it by blood. And because Jesus has gone to the cross, he has already become the sacrifice we need so that I don't have to come to God with a lamb in tow so I can approach him. Because of Jesus, I can boldly approach the throne of grace now. You realize how incredible that is? I was a pastor's kid growing up. I don't know if you know what that's like, but I was a pastor's kid growing up. And what that meant for me was that I could walk into the church and if I needed something, I could walk right up to the office of the pastor and I could walk right in if there was a need. My dad had a standing rule for the admins who worked at our church. If my son's ever in trouble, interrupt any meeting I'm in because that's my son. I could boldly walk in. Understand what that means for the death of Jesus for us. We are now the children of God, and each and every one of us have the right to walk right into the throne room of God, because I need to approach him. Jesus has made that possible in our worship 
And we have to take advantage of the privilege of worship. Not just politically, well, it's great that we're free to worship, but spiritually, because God's presence approaches us in worship. Whenever we come together in faith, we come together knowing that God is present, that God is with us, and that God is for us. And when we come together in worship, we come together as a declaration of who God is for everyone who needs to hear it, including the world and including Satan. You know the reason we don't worship? We don't worship because God is insecure. God doesn't need us to tell him how great he is because God's concerned we don't think that or, or God is worried about what we're really thinking about him. There's no insecurity on the part of God. The reason we come to God and worship is it's the only way to have an honest relationship with God. If I'm gonna have a relationship with someone that's healthy, it has to be based on trust and it has to be based on honesty. And if I'm going to be honest about God to God, that's going to sound like worship. Because that's all worship is, is an honest relationship with God. We talk to God about who he is. We talk to God about what God has done for us. We're being honest about God to God, and the world needs to hear that. Satan needs to hear that. You realize whenever the church gathers together in worship, once again we're declaring to Satan, you're not in charge. You're not in control. And our worship becomes a testimony to that. We practice our sanctification by our worship. We also practice our sanctification by our walk. Most uses of the word sanctification in theology are related to how we live out our lives as Christians. And it matters because for people to be introduced to God's presence, they have to first trust God's presence. And for people to trust God's presence, they have to know they can trust God's people. When the Spirit sanctifies us, he's setting us apart from the inside out. And what does that look like? It looks like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. In other words, the fruit of the Spirit here in Galatians 5 is the evidence that our sanctification is at work. How many of you would love to see miracles in your lifetime. You would love to see the hand of God at work. But it matters more that you see that from a community that's loving, that's joyful, that's peaceful, that's faithful, that's gentle. Because imagine you take all those words away and now you have a minister who isn't loving, who isn't joyful who isn't peaceful, who isn't gentle, who isn't faithful, and I'm gonna tell you pretty much the miracles of God aren't gonna matter after that. Because what matters to people more is the character. Doesn't mean the charismata doesn't matter, but it doesn't have staying power if there's not character behind it. And our sanctification has to result in character change. The Holy Spirit's at work in us. It's the Holy Spirit who fills our worship it's the Holy Spirit who guides our lives. And the more we behave like the Spirit, the more like Christ we act, and the more attractive God's presence becomes for other people. We practice our sanctification by our worship, we practice our sanctification by our walk, and we practice our sanctification by our witness. We are set apart so that we can bear witness to the reign of Jesus in the world. God wants us to represent him well, which is the other reason he sanctifies us. He doesn't want us to just be in his presence. He wants us to represent his presence. The church sometimes acts like it's a museum set up in memory of Jesus. So we come together and we talk about Jesus, we sing songs about Jesus, but all we're trying to do is keep the memory of Jesus alive. That's not who we are. The church isn't a museum set up in memory of Jesus. The church is an embassy that represents the reign of Jesus. And as an embassy, we are ambassadors to Christ. You know the three kinds of people that need an embassy? One are citizens of the country that embassy belongs to. There are people who come to embassies, why? Because they wanna go back home. 
And people who come to our church as an embassy who belong to Christ, they are here because they want to go back home. There are also people who take use of an embassy because they're visitors. They'd like to go to an embassy because they'd like to visit the country that embassy represents. And there are people who come to our church because they're trying to find out whether this is a country they would like to go to. But there's a third group that need an embassy. You have citizens, you have visitors, tourists, but you also have asylum seekers. And there are people who seek out an embassy because they are running away from the country they're a part of. And they're asking if this embassy can protect them. I once saw an example of this when I was a pastor. I pastored for a number of years in Los Angeles. And our church was right across the street from a police station. And one Sunday morning, there was a guy who was pulled over by the police right in front of the station. Turned out it was just a traffic violation, but he had a number of warrants out for his arrest. So what happened was he freaked out when they took his driver's license. He knew that it was going to come back. There were warrants out for his arrest. So he jumps out of his car and he just starts running down the street. Of course, the police call it in and everyone who's in the station, they get on foot and they start running after this guy. Now across the street is our church. So on a Sunday morning during worship, this guy runs into our church with half the police force running after him. (laughs) It's in the middle of worship. The police don't interrupt. They actually just put some officer on every single exit in the sanctuary. The guy runs down to the front. One of our pastors comes down to meet him and he declares quite loudly, I need God and I need God right now. (laughs) That's an asylum seeker. That's someone who says, you're the only place I can turn to for help. As a church, we have to make sure we still seem safe for those seeking asylum. Sometimes we'll put up unnecessary barriers that say to people, you're not gonna be welcome here, you're not gonna be safe here. But if we act like that, we're not living in our sanctification. We sanctify, we are sanctified in our worship, in our walk, in our witness. And the Holy Spirit helps us at each level. It's the Spirit who gifts us for worship. It's the Spirit who gives us fruit in our walk, and it's the Spirit who empowers us in witness. So as I close this message in prayer, I want to pray for the Spirit and the sanctification of this church. We've had a whole series on big words. We talked about immutability, propitiation, justification, now sanctification. But what I want you to see is all of these big words, they're not big words just because you didn't know them, They're big words because they're full of meaning and they have to be unpacked. But if you actually put them together, you're telling a story that people need to hear in order to approach God. Imagine the person who has never approached God and you talk to them about God. And maybe you don't use the words immutability, but what does it mean? It means you can trust God. Because God is always the same everywhere he is. And if God was like this for me, he'll be like that for you. And you tell someone, you can trust God. He's immutable. So now they turn to God. But they turn to God and they're like, oh, wait a minute. I'm now afraid of God because of my own sin. As a pastor in LA, many times working with gang members, I'd have people who say to me, you talk to me about God, but you don't know what I've done. You don't know what I've done. I've had people say, if I walk into your church, God's gonna strike me dead. Well, now we tell them about propitiation. And we don't have to give them the word, but we explain what it means. Christ's blood has already covered your sins. If you will accept it, you can be forgiven. You can approach God. Okay, but how do I approach God? Do I get on my hands and my knees? Do I grovel? Do I crawl? No, no. You've also been justified. God declares you innocent in his presence. Stand up, face God. Not as someone on trial for your life, but as a child being welcomed home. He is immutable. He has offered an act of propitiation. You have been justified in his presence. And now this last word, you've been sanctified. You cannot just be in the presence of God. 
but now you can reflect that presence back to the world. These words explain how we approach God and how God wants to use us. So as I close in a word of prayer, here's the three things I wanna pray for. I wanna pray for salvation. There may be those who are listening to this that you've never actually asked Jesus to come into your heart to forgive you of your sins. You've never taken advantage of the sacrifice of Christ. I wanna pray for you this morning. You can be forgiven, and before this morning is out, you can have peace with God. I wanna pray for those of you in here as Christians who may be struggling. I've called you saints because that's what you are, but as soon as you hear the word, you think about all the reasons you don't deserve that word. You think about the things that you've been struggling with in your life. And I wanna pray for you because God wants you to live in victory. The process is still going on in your life and God hasn't given up on you and you shouldn't give up on you either. And then I wanna pray for our service that we would represent the presence of God to the rest of the world the way God has called. So let's pray. Father, I thank you for everyone who is here, who is listening to what it means to belong to you. And God, I'm asking if there be any here who have never asked you to come into their life, to forgive them of their sins, they've never committed their life to you, God, I'm praying right now that they would simply pray, Jesus, I believe because of what you did on the cross, I can be forgiven. I ask you to forgive me of all my sins and that you would make me your child, and I pray this in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray for the saints in this community who are struggling with that word because they're struggling with sin in their life. God, they've been forgiven, but Lord, there are things they may return to. There are things they are facing. There are things that are keeping them from walking the walk the way you require. And God, I ask that they would see the work of the Spirit already in their life and know, God, that they don't have to give up because you haven't given up. Father, I pray for this entire community that you would make us the people that you have already set apart for your presence, that we would not just enjoy you when we come together, but the world could see you when we go back out. Help us to represent you so the world can be filled with your presence. And now, God, I pray the words of Paul in 1 Thessalonians 5.23 over this entire community. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. And we pray these words in Jesus' name. Amen.